Have you ever met one of those people who just can't be stopped? It's like they're unstoppable. Yeah, I have. Me too. What's their mystique? Nothing stops these people. Stop. Stop. Welcome to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. You're about to meet some of the most amazing people. They've accomplished their goals despite insurmountable odds. They beat adversity, physical hardship, and traumatic events, and emerge triumphantly. They're people just like you and me, and they're winners. Are you unstoppable? Here's Frankie to show you how. And hello there, and welcome to another Mission Unstoppable. I am so excited to be here today because I have the most amazing guest. Uh, I'm just Ah, I'm so excited. <laughs> I told you I was. We are going to go on a mission unstoppable with Teresa de Grobois. She is here joining us today, and she's going to teach us about the rules and the strategies and the guidelines to becoming an influential leader. Teresa specializes in the topic of influence and success. And she wants to change the planet one word of mouth epidemic at a time. She's definitely an expert in her field, and she has a proven track record in understanding how word of mouth epidemics work. Since her three books got to bestseller status in only eight months, her book Mass Influence hit number one international bestseller in North America and Europe on the same day it launched. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> Teresa teaches business and marketing courses around the globe, including teaching courses to startup entrepreneurs in developing countries. She's the chair of the Evolutionary Business Council, and she leads an international invitation-only council of speakers and influencers dedicated to teaching the principles of success. She's also the co-founder of the Global Influence Summit. Now, if you're passionate about changing the world and the lives of others, Teresa's gift to you today is going to be the knowledge that she passes on. So listen for those nuggets and gems of wisdom because I know she will be sharing generously. In fact, you're part of her plan. You see, her big goal is have transformational principles touch the lives of 1.2 billion people by 2020 by growing 1,200 thought leaders. Are you one of them? (laughs) Teresa, welcome. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Thank just you. Wow, out what here. a big up. Now I've got a lot to uh, live up to here. Ah, you <laughs> so do it in your sleep. Here. <laughs> well, you know, you definitely, we're going to delve into the influence and success, ah, success talk today. But first, you know, it's Mission Unstoppable. And on this show, I like to know, you know, where people came from and then how you got to be where you are today. And I think it's really important for people to know that anybody can be you really you know so let's go back in time if we can back to your childhood tell us where you grew up what your family dynamic was like your favorite toy Let, let's go where, 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 where did you grow up well my favorite toy would be easy we were so poor I did not have one <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I actually grew up in northern Canada northern Ontario for those who know Canada um, in fact we used to spend our summers on a remote backwoods cabin uh, we go in by boat every year, just in time to see the hatching of the little baby mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> no. But, you know, being the youngest of nine, you know, as a kid, and, you know, and being in an environment where the only people around were my siblings, mm-hmm. you know, so I developed a lot of inner dialogue as a child around importance. Uh, You know, because I really didn't understand what my place in the family was, especially given that, you know, when I came along, the family already had a full hockey team. (laughs) (laughs) Hockey, baseball. uh, (laughs) You know, and hockey being the major religion in northern Canada, you know. So, you know, I had a lot of inner dialogue around, uh, you know, am I important? Am I worthy? Do I matter? Do I count? And in a way, that was a gift to me. You know, go figure that I should eventually become a global authority on the topic of influence because importance became a really important conversation to me at a very young age. And that's often what happens with people is their inner dialogue drives them in both good and bad ways, you know? Exactly. Now, did, did, did I read that your mom forgot to feed you one day? <laughs> No, yeah, I talk about that in my book. And, you know, I had awesome parents. I really yeah. did. Um, and at the same time, you know, my mom was, you know, was a caregiver for two elderly grandmothers. Oh, um, wow. She had nine kids. She always had a ton of things on the go. 
And I actually can remember a day when as a child, you know, mom has fed all the other kids, chaos reigned in our household. And, um, and she forgot to feed me. And I'm, I'm, I remember sitting in my high chair watching her scrape the food into the garbage thinking, oh, no. I'm not important. I'm less than that stinking garbage because the garbage is getting fed and I'm not, you know. Wow. And, and as a child, that shattered me. I added so much meaning to, to something that had no mm-hmm. meaning. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, in my mom's world, she was an awesome, loving, wonderful mom. But little kids often do that, you know, and research actually shows that most human beings, uh, good people everywhere, w- as children, we created meaning to stuff that didn't necessarily even need to have that meaning. And often we create a dominant inner dialogue of, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, I'm not important, I'm not good enough, I'm not good at speaking in front of people. Everybody's got some version of that going on. Everybody. And everybody. <laughs> well, you know, unless you're a sociopath, sociopaths have inner dialogue. There's just a little different than the rest of the world. Um, but most good people do have a lot of negative self-talk that can stop them, especially when they feel called to step up and lead or be influential in the world. You know, and when you think about what that really means, what that means is that good people, everyday heroes that would cause change in the world are the ones that tend to most trip themselves up when it comes to actually creating that change. So we really do need to learn to overcome that negative self-talk if we want to leave a better world behind to our children. I want to ask you, how do you tell people, I know how I do it, but how do you tell people to hear that inner dialogue? Because sometimes, you know, it's difficult. Yeah, it can be. Um, I actually have a takeaway I can give your listeners. Do you want to give them a takeaway? Sure, absolutely. You know, here's a really good exercise for the next seven days, every night before bed, journal what your negative self-talk was that day. And a good way to find it is think about every time you felt called to step up and lead or put yourself out there in any way that might have been uncomfortable, what do you tell yourself? And, you know, you can even do it right now in this moment. If you thought about playing a bigger game, going for that big promotion or or taking on that bigger level in business or um, maybe it's going on television or speaking at a big event, what's that thing that represents a bigger game to you that actually scares you and what do you tell yourself in that moment? You know, it might be, I don't have enough credentials. I'm not smart enough. Nobody's going to listen to me. Uh, it might be, I'm too tall, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm a woman, I'm too fat, I'm too thin. Um, you know, but there's something that you Mm -hmm. tell yourself in the, in that moment and notice what it is and start journaling it. And, you know, here's the real juice of this exercise. Here's where this exercise is really cool. Don't just journal where that hinders you. Because it's good to notice where that's stopping you in life. Because that inner dialogue, most people have a theme to their inner dialogue. Sure. Whatever your theme is, it's stopping you everywhere. But also, journal where it helps you. Because it's also probably motivating you in a whole lot of places. Right. You know, I'm yes. not important. That it's saving create... you somewhere. Yeah, I'm not as important. Well. As a child, actually fed me to become someone who really studied and watched importance in other people to the level that I, I started actually breaking it down. Well, and, I noticed and, that, sorry, I just, I just noticed that one of your jobs was to, was to bring food to people, mm-hmm. which yeah. is kind of interesting. Yeah, that was, you know, one of my earliest jobs uh, in Northern Ontario as a summer student was running groceries to the fire crews fighting forest fires. How exciting and, uh, is that? And that was neat because it, it actually allowed me to see a certain number of wildfires up close, which, you know, they're incredible forces of nature. You, you know, they're scary. Don't get me wrong. And they're destructive. But at the same time, they're incredible forces of rebirth, you know. And, and that whole notion fascinated me that things could change that rapidly. And so when I started studying influence, I started realizing you know, word of mouth epidemic is not unlike how a wildfire operates. Mm -hmm. You know, where um, if you've ever watched a wildfire, they're not linear. They don't expand outward in a line. Wildfires can jump miles in seconds um, by having a new hotspot blow up from the wind, right? And word of mouth epidemics happen a lot the same way. You'll have influential people talking about something 
And all of a sudden, a new raving fan might spring up somewhere else, totally unexpected, miles from the original epicenter. And all of a sudden, word of mouth will start spreading in that region, too. And word of mouth epidemics often happen that way. They're unpredictable, and they're awesome, and they're wonderful. And didn't the the, the fire chief give you three, you know, he, he gave you three um, words of advice or, or three uh, things that happened with a wildfire that, that you actually took, because your, your company's called Wildfire, and you took those three things yeah. with you and created your program. You know, and a lot of people probably have heard these too, right? But every wildfire needs three things. And I, I remember the day that the, um, the crew chief was telling me this, and he was saying, you know, you need spark fuel, and wind. And when you've got all three, you're going to need a lot of groceries. <laughs> that was his expression, right? Because I was the grocery runner. Yeah. But I really thought what he meant, and, and I thought, you know, word of mouth epidemics, you know, you can actually use that as an analogy for them. The spark is like, what's that big idea you have? What's that problem you solve for the world? And, and the bigger the problem you know, the bigger the influence, the bigger the wildfire. In fact, the bigger the profit, the bigger the problem. You know, we often hear that adage in business, right? Yes. And, um, you know, what that really comes down to is how much of service are you to other people? Right. And, and this is where I see a lot of people in business making this mistake where they think, I'll just practice on solving these little problems. I'll practice at business. You see this in the entrepreneurial world a lot mm -hmm. where people mm -hmm. think, let me do this little business. I'll franchise someone else's business, or maybe I'll start a multi-level marketing business. Nothing against either of those models, okay? But if you're not really passionate about it, if you're not really lit up about it, then essentially what you're doing is you're practicing at business. If it's not something you really care about, other people aren't likely to care about it either, and it's actually going to be very difficult for you to sell. That's a really great place to stop because we're going to go to commercial break. And I think when we come back, it might be a really good segue into authenticity because I, I, I Perfect. if you agree with that, uh, we yeah. can talk about that because I, I agree with you. I think that, that you know, um, it's very important to believe in what you're selling. If you don't, people know. So let's go there when we get back. This is Mission Unstoppable Radio. I am your host, Frankie Picasso. And my guest today is Teresa de Grabois. Listening, Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. It's words you never heard. Mike McMillan from Ontario, Canada was driving to a meeting when he saw what looked like a can of cola moving around on the side of the road. Curious, he stopped to investigate and discovered a skunk had gotten its head stuck in a soda can. After a moment of abulia, or indecision, he decided to try and save the potentially woofy animal. Woofy is another word for smelly. He grabbed the can and engaged in dang swaying, or a cooperative tug of war with the skunk, all the while hoping he wouldn't get sprayed. Finally, the skunk managed to pop its head out of the can and land safely on the ground. After a brief stare down, the skunk turned and ran into the woods. What's another word for running away in fright? Funkify. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Golf is a good way to supplement your fitness program, but watch out for golf injuries. The most common occur in the low back, elbows, shoulders, hands, and wrists and are defined as either cumulative from overuse or acute traumatic injuries. The impact and stress of the repetitive motion of the swing is sometimes hard on the muscles and joints. The Mayo Clinic says it's important to consider ways to reduce your risk of golf injuries. They recommend that you warm up first. Be sure to start slowly, work up to your desired level of play, strengthen your muscles to protect your joints, and reduce your risk of injury and build up your endurance. Focus on flexibility and keep your muscles pliable, strong, and flexible. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. If you're a fan of Fitness Minute, like us on Facebook. And we're back. It's Mission Unstoppable Radio. I told you we'd be back. My guest is Teresa de Grobois today. And we just were talking about 
influence and how to become influential. And when I when we came back, I said we're going to talk about um, how how to be authentic. So let's talk about the authenticity, Teresa, and why it's so important. Well, you know, one of the reasons I wrote Mass Influence was because this one habit, when I talk about the habits of the highly influential, is probably the one that trips people up the most. And, you know, and really, we're basically all good people out there. Really, they're, when you look at society, there's it's few and far between the people out there that don't want to lead a good life, that don't want to create a better world, that don't want to create change. And yet we are our own worst enemies, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different definitions of authenticity out there. Here's mine. It's very simple. Authenticity is simply your inside voice saying the same thing as your outside voice. Mm -hmm. In other words, your thoughts are in alignment with your words and your actions. Very important. Yeah. Very important. And, 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 you know, people, let's just talk about that for just for a second, because there's a vibe that goes with that. And, you know, you, you've been around people who are trying to, you know, quote unquote, sell you something. And you're going, oh, I just feel like they're like a mm -hmm. scam artist, yeah. or I feel like something's going on here. And it's really because they're not authentic. You're reading yeah. that from them, right? Exactly. And so anytime you're not doing a business or a role that you really, really love, you run the risk of being inauthentic, right? Because you can tell if you're talking to a salesman and, their inside voice is saying, oh, God, I need this sale. Please mm -hmm. buy this thing. And outwardly, they're saying, this is a really great product. You should buy it, right? <laughs> yeah, buy and, 10. <laughs> you know, but we can tell, right? And so other people can tell when you're not congruent, you know? Exactly. And it's, it's not like it's an on-off switch. I think there are degrees of authenticity. As human beings, we all struggle with this. But by and large, and this is why I say the fuel in your wildfire is your passion level, how much do you love what you're doing? Because mm -hmm. if you don't love, love, love what you do, and you don't love the people you work with, you know, your contractors, your coworkers, your suppliers, whoever, if you don't deeply love all of that, then you're running the risk of being inauthentic everywhere. And so this is where leaning in the direction of always choosing the things you love, the things that light you up the most, is going to actually make the most importance to your own influence with other people. Absolutely. You know, there's so many people who are doing what they don't love. Mm -hmm. And and the fear is, if I do what I do love, then, uh, you know, I'm not going to make the money, or I might not be able to provide for my family, or, or you know, the, just my family's not going to disown me, all kinds mm -hmm. of things, because so many people don't get to do what they love, because yeah, of other people. <laughs> really, exactly. You know, and, you know, we convince ourselves that you cannot create your own life. You know, mm -hmm. and it's very true what they say in business. And I've really learned this as a business owner that you do become like the five people you most hang out with. You know, you become the average of them. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's one of the reasons I, I am creating an intentional community down in Costa Rica for people who believe in these transformational success based principles that billionaires tend to live by is that I, I, you know, I wanted to be able to pick my own neighbors. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be able to attract the kind of people down there that would elevate me and get, get me thinking bigger and me thinking more expansively. Because the reality is a lot of people visit their own fears on you when you try and lean toward your dreams. Oh, yes. don't do that. It's too risky. You'll never make it. But the reality is your dreams are scarier to you than they are to anyone else on the planet because they're your dreams. That's freaking huge. Right? That is and, so true. And yes. yet you're the one that's best hardwired to live your dreams, right? Because yep. you'll be most passionate about your dreams. You'll be more committed to achieving them. There is no one else on this planet more capable of achieving your dreams than you are because someone else isn't going to love them as much as you do. That's correct. And and so the fear is not just, you know, the people, if the naysayers around you're going, uh, it's not going to work out for you, then you have to, unfortunately, you have to drop people away. If you want to live your dream, that is a hard choice that a lot of yeah. people have to make. Yeah. And learn to say, thanks for sharing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. And that. the reality is it's nothing is permanent, right? Like you might have to for a little while, avoid the people like when I was making the courageous decision to leave, uh, you know, a leadership job in the oil and gas industry. 
and move over to owning my own business again because it was the second time I had started a business at that point. But my mother was the person with the greatest level of fear. You know, every phone call, she was like, are you sure you want to leave a really good pension, honey? And you're a single mom. And how can you be this irresponsible? And I had to make a decision for a few months that mom and I just weren't allowed to talk about it. Yeah. You know, and I know that hurt her, that I did not want to engage in conversation on that. But if she brought up the subject, I would just either quickly change the subject or end the call. And so that doesn't mean, did I cut my mother out of my life? No, of course not. She's, you know, no one cuts their mother out of their life, right? (laughs) But I had to cut her out of that conversation. And I had to create a little bit of distance while I was going through it in order to have the courage to make that leap. Now, years after that, you know, she was the first to say, wow, I, I, you know, I can't believe you did it was, you know, usually the first thing she would say, but also then she would say how proud of me she was. Of course. You know, because that was her fear coming up. And of course, often it's the people that that's closest to you that have the greatest fear because a, they didn't have the courage to go out and do it and you threaten their own inner dialogue, but B, they're legitimately scared for you. It's true. You know, and and so you just have to really choose who are you going to be around because your influence lies in the realm of what are you most passionate about. That's how you become most influential. I like um, you you said that what if becoming an influential leader is as simple as investing the influence you have every single day? And I love that because influence becomes a currency. Yeah, it really is, you know. In fact, money was just something we invented on this planet to help us see how energy moved around, how the exchange of value moved around. So we invented money because we needed some kind of placeholder to help scorekeep because for people who really didn't get the game that well, they needed scorekeeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you actually see amongst the powerful on this planet And I don't necessarily mean wealthy when I say powerful, because there have been very powerful people on this planet who understood the influence game that weren't necessarily wealthy, but they were highly abundant. Like Mother Teresa would be an example. She raised billions of dollars for her not-for-profit business. She was a highly abundant individual, probably one of the most successful business owners this planet has ever seen. Just what she chose to do with that abundance and money was different than the average person. Is this making sense? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, she was passionate about what she did. Yeah. So when we look at how the powerful tend to work, they have sort of habits and skills, and they operate differently than the average person. And it's it's really important to understand that there. It's not like this is right and that's wrong. That's sort of like saying hockey's right and basketball's wrong. No, they're Mm -hmm. just different sports. Right. right. And you talk about that in your book. You talk about how, you know, if you're, if you're going to engage in the game, it's really not fair if you don't know the rules and you don't know the rules. We don't exactly. know the rules. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like getting on, on, on the ice and trying to play basketball. So, yeah, this looks weird. <laughs> it's weird. It's awkward. <laughs> and People... you'll probably slip and fall on your butt. Hockey makes such a great analogy for everything, it does. doesn't it? As a it's Canadian, so I almost feel like it's my patriotic duty to use <laughs> hockey everywhere. <laughs> but it really does make a great analogy for how influence works, right? Because if hockey were influence, it's like once you get the game, it's not that hard. Right. But if you don't know how to skate and you don't have a stick, and you try and bring your basketball onto the hockey rink and you stand there wondering why are all these people freaking shooting pucks at me? What the heck is going on? A, you look foolish. B, you're likely to end up on your butt on the rink. And C, there's no power or effect in that. And it's not that basketball is wrong and hockey is right. There's just a different way of engaging in each sport. And it's kind of interesting, too, because if you want to take that analogy of hockey, when you play hockey, if you are going to be a giver, an influencer, and, and give to other people, you are going to be more, you know, highly, you, you might even be the NBA, you know, of, of the game, as opposed yeah. to some guy who skates off and, and just shoots all the pucks and like, leaves his team behind because he's not a team player. So, yeah. it, it, you know, by giving away the shot or, or helping set up a shot, yeah. that's exactly what influencers are doing. Yeah, you're exactly. When you introduce yeah. me to somebody or somebody to somebody, you're, you're helping them. Yeah, and I don't want to step over that point because this is it in a nutshell. So if you're listening, this is the point to pay attention. 
it really comes down to this. You can't make yourself famous or influential. Mm -hmm. You can only give influence to other people and they can give it back to you. You know, and, and I want to draw the distinction between fame and influence because a lot of people yeah. don't think about that distinction. But fame is a lot of people know you. And influence, or mass influence at least, is a lot of people know, like, and trust you. I think they trust would take is action. a big word. <laughs> yeah, they would take action based on your word, right? So, right. like, fame might be like Kim Kardashian. Influence would be like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Not that, not that Kim Kardashian doesn't have some level of influence as well. I'm not dissing Kim Kardashian, right? No. But there are different levels of influence that can come with fame, and they relate to how much do people like and trust you inside of a lot of people knowing you, right? And a lot of it, what, what it comes down to, one of the reasons Oprah Winfrey became one of the most influential people on the planet was because she had a show where she gave influence to other people often mm -hmm. 40 or 50 times a show. Mm -hmm. there would be a main guest and sub guest and then she'd have people in the audience that she'd shout out and you know and all of those people would go home and promote the show oh my god I was on Oprah Winfrey everybody watched this episode and until it became the biggest phenom on the planet but she was a master of understanding the influence game because she always made everyone she was working with look like the hero she did she's amazing and she I think that that's you know it's due to her authenticity and, and reputation too. It's a biggie because yeah. we trusted her because she, she, you know, proved herself time and time again. Yeah. She didn't absolutely. back a dark horse, you know, or yeah. she didn't back a bad horse. Let's put it that way. She, you know, if she, if she said you can trust Teresa, we knew that we could trust Teresa. Yeah. And, and we're going to go to another commercial break. Um, go ahead. Sorry. If you had to finish. No, no, go ahead. You can go to the break. Okay. <laughs> dun dun dun. Now we have a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's Teresa going to talk about when she comes back? Oh no. <laughs> it's going to be something really good. I promise you that. Uh, you are listening to Mission Unstoppable Radio. My guest today is Teresa Dickerbois. She is a master influencer. Her book is called Mass Influence. And if you go look it up, you can even get it for free. And we'll talk about that too. Why is it for free? How interesting is that? All of this wonderful information. And it comes with a gift. Listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert Annette Hammond. Did you know that the average teenager drinks twice as much soda as milk? Since 1983, sugar consumption in the U.S. is up 28%. Why is that? There are several reasons, but one of the most common is soft drinks. 20 ounce beverages have become the norm, and it's not surprising to find that 43% of our sugar comes from drinks. Sugar is blamed for poor nutritional diets. USDA data shows that people whose diets are high in added sugar eat less calcium, fiber, iron, protein, and many other important nutrients. Fat-free foods are also a culprit. Since sugar is fat-free, many people tend to think it's okay to eat as much as they want. Remember that just because a food is fat-free does not mean that it's calorie-free also. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert Annette Hammond. Oh, the benefits of fiber. A high-fiber diet can lower your blood cholesterol levels, normalize your digestive function, and improve control of your blood sugar levels. It can even help you lose weight by giving you a feeling of fullness longer. So consequently, you don't eat as much. According to Livestrong, the University of Illinois says that we should be consuming 25 to 35 grams of fiber every day. The Journal of the American Diabetic Association found that a diet consisting of whole grain oat cereal, which is high in fiber, decreased LDL levels, which is the bad cholesterol, by almost 8% among overweight adults. So load up on cereal, grains, fruit, and vegetables and increase your fiber intake. I'm Annette Hammond. For more fitness and weight loss tips, visit our website at AnnetteHammond.com. Uh, she's one of the most influential people in the world. You've got to believe that. Her book is called Mass Influence. Her name is Teresa de Gorbois, and she is my guest today. Teresa and I have been talking about influence and leadership and 
you know, what makes you influential, what makes you influential versus famous. And I think that was a really good analogy between Kim and Oprah. We talked about that just before the break. But coming back, I want to talk to you about a big mistake that people make. People would, you know, if they're lucky enough to meet you, Teresa, they might say, oh, Teresa, I just loved what you just talked about. Um, Here's my book. Would you promote it for me? So wrong move. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and this is where, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily that there's a right and a wrong way of doing things, but we tend to learn a rule book. Well, and we first start learning this rule book in the sandbox, right? We learn rules of fairness. I do this for you and you do that for me. And, you know, um, Caldini talks about this in his book about influence, how there's this reciprocity that gets created between human beings. And when you deal with people on similar influence levels, it tends to be a scorekeeping type scenario. Not that most people keep score, but there's an even flow of energy that moves back and forth. And then we learn things like networking and business. And we learn, for example, that it's a good tactic if you want to meet a colleague, that it's not a bad idea to offer to buy them coffee or lunch or give them a product sample. And that's very appropriate to do when you're dealing with two people of similar levels of influence. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when you're wanting to network upward, where you're trying to get to know people of much higher levels of influence, this is where it's like a new sport kicks in. And you've been playing basketball your whole life. And now all of a sudden you're on the hockey rink. I mean, you only have to to phone up the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and offer to buy them coffee. And faster than you can say gatekeeper, (laughs) you'll learn (laughs) there's a different set of rules around that kind of a gesture, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what it comes down to is it's almost like, you know, when you meet the new neighbor, you know, if you're the guy that comes by and says, oh, I love that lawnmower I saw you just running up the walk. I can't wait to borrow that. Of course, that would be inappropriate. That we'd call that an, a premature ask, right? People always <laughs> laugh. And say, premature what? Right? Premature right? ask. Yeah. But in the world of influence, giving a book, a CD, or a product sample to someone who's highly influential, really, that's all about you. You want them to try your product, and the inference is you're looking for an endorsement. You offer to buy them lunch or coffee. The inference is you're looking for an hour of their time for right. the price of a seven dollar latte. Those two things aren't actually equivalent in value in our society. An hour of Oprah Winfrey's time, I have no idea what that's worth, mm-hmm. but I bet it's worth millions. You know, you know I, I, mean? I had Ivan Meisner on the show many years ago, and Ivan, oh, yeah, Ivan you know, the head of BNI. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he was wonderful. And, and Ivan, you know, he said, givers get, but never ask for anything from anybody, anybody, yeah. until you've given them, like, at least three things. Like, you've yeah. given them, and, and you've looked after them, and you've created a relationship with them, and they even know your name. You, know? Like, yeah. you have to be in that position. So what do you think about this idea of emotional intelligence? You know, how would you know, for some people, obviously, they don't, but how would they know when you've established enough of a relationship that I could say, I could call you, Teresa, and say, hey, Teresa, what do you think of this? Yeah, well, that's going to vary. And that's a really good question, right? Because a lot of people stand in that. And, you know, your first sign of when it's okay to ask is when the other person starts offering, Mm. you know, Um, because when the other person starts offering, reciprocity exists. And sometimes that can build up in a single phone call or a single meeting. But when you're dealing with people with widely different energy or widely different influence levels, Like, let's say you're a local business owner and you're trying to build relationship with a local television reporter. Maybe you run a health-oriented business and you're trying to get in relationship with the person who always does the health segments on the evening news. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have to be in a relationship of giving to them to kickstart the reciprocity for a year or two before you're high enough on their radar that there will be reciprocity back. But one news piece on you can mean millions of dollars of revenue for a business, right? So right. depending on how your business is set up, whether you're, you know, if you're a service provider, the number is going to be a lot smaller because you're confined by the hours in the week. But that's a different conversation. The idea is that influential people, by very nature of what they do, they tend to have stronger boundaries because more people are coming at them wanting stuff. But if you give and give and give, you know, either one one of two things is happening. Either you're just not there yet, and they are a fit for you, or they might just not be an energetic fit for you, and you're investing your energy in the wrong place. 
And so a really good thing to do is kind of tune in to your own higher intuition and try and figure out which of those two things is happening. Yeah, good, good advice. You, you talk about, um, there's an exercise in the book uh, in the 30 day influence challenge um, where you, you know, you tell people to list 10 influencers, people who are influential in the area that they wish to be influential in. So it sounds almost counterintuitive in a way, but why tell, tell us why, why should we do that? Why would we want to be like the other 10 people? Or why would we, are we looking, what are we looking for when we do that? Well, you know, I often tell people to list 10 influencers because I, A, I want them to think about what constitutes influence in your field. Like, mm-hmm. no, first of all, notice why those people are influential. You know, they might be a magazine editor or uh, maybe they run a big conference. But the key clue to someone's influential is they're probably working in a one to many context instead of dealing with people one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we can start to gauge their influence by how big is their following. Mm -hmm. Right. So a television reporter who has a million people watch their show every night is actually from a mass influence standpoint, more influential than a business owner that has 300 people reporting to them. And in fact, the business owner might have a certain level of influence over their employees, but those employees may follow, take action on based what they say, but they might not know, like, and trust them. So their main, the influence will be confined to the business itself and not outside the business. A truly mass influential person can give advice on anything and people will tend to listen. So in other words, if, if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, this is a really great brand of toothpaste, probably thousands of people would have used that toothpaste. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Because he had that much trust, even though toothpaste had nothing to do with what the man stood for. And I don't, I, please don't take that as me in any way diminishing the work no. that he did. I'm just <laughs> using an analogy, right? Because he's actually yes. one of my heroes. Yes. But he was that heroic to people that we would trust anything coming out of his mouth, right? So it's important to notice some of those distinctions. But when you do that list of 10 people, it's also important to notice that you know, people will often say, I'm going to be on Oprah Winfrey someday, or they'll have some like Mount Everest like goal, right? Mm -hmm. Which is good. It's good to have a Mount Everest like goal. But if you want to climb Everest, then you've got to take some action around learning how to mountain climb. Right. And you don't start with Mount Everest, you start with local hills in your area, and then you move up to scaling mountain peaks. And then you do higher and higher peaks till you're ready for Everest, right? And influence is the same way. That's why I often get people to rank order the list. Who's most accessible to you? You start with building a relationship with those people. When no like and trust has been built up, Mm -hmm. then they'll start connecting you with other influential people. And influence is really as simple as moving your way up the list. In fact, you have no idea where that list will take you once you start meeting influential people. I've met thousands of wonderful people because of the connections I do amongst other people. In fact, I, I think know, that's the way you and I met. That's yeah. how we met. It's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I it's just love how, how it all works out. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the thing is, you, in the book, you, ha- you give an example of a friend who said, you know, they didn't like me. And it's not you personally that they don't like. So you have to have kind of a thick skin, too, because yeah. it's not you, you know. Yeah. What are you making no mean? You know, mm-hmm. so so you offered to buy someone influential a coffee and they said no. It's like, you oh, know, now they're a big a hole, right? Now they're like, yeah. And, you know, pe- people tend to say, oh, they're just arrogant, they're nasty, whatever. And no, it's just you just played the sport wrong. That's mm-hmm. all. And, and it, there's no morality to that. You're not a bad person. You just made a little mistake. So step past it and do it right. You know, there you go. And it's it's like people create so much energy around. A, it's really hard to learn to be influential. Where am I going to find the time? Uh, Or they create all this meaning behind what does it mean when someone influential says they won't meet with me or they don't have time or whatever. And it's like, it doesn't mean anything other than that they don't have time. Like, it doesn't mean they don't want to have a relationship with you. It doesn't mean you don't have another opportunity, right? Yep. And really, like, I love using the analogy of breathing. Influence really is as simple as breathing. And, and by that, I mean, there was actually a time in your life where you had to learn the skill of breathing. In, in fact, you came out of this beautiful, warm environment where you didn't have to breathe. And it, it was shocking. And you cried and it hurt. And somebody whacked you on the back. <laughs> yeah. And you're wondering, what the heck is this person doing beating up on me right now? And it was traumatic. And then 
in a few seconds, you mastered the skill of breathing and you started breathing in and breathing out. And then largely after that point, you never thought about the skill of breathing again. It simply became the way you moved through your day. You didn't go through your day going, oh my God, I've got to spend 24 hours today breathing. <laughs> yeah. Where will I find the time? You didn't do that, right? Other than maybe yes. there were moments where you realized you know, that there's an advanced level of breathing with Qigong or yoga and, or maybe your best friend elbowed you in the rig, ribs and said, honey, you're not breathing right now. Maybe take yeah. a deep breath because you're really nervous, you know. But in general, you don't think about breathing until you realize that there is a black belt level of breathing when we really want to get calm and centered, right? And influence is a lot like that. It's like once you master some element of influence, you're not going through your day going, oh, God, I got to spend at least six hours today being influential and doing all these habits. Where am I going to find the time? No, you simply start moving through your day doing the habits that highly influential people tend to do. And they're not a time drain. You just operate differently. And right. therefore, your influence builds. You know, and, and it's a perfect opportunity also to check what you're going to say, you know, in your journal tonight about what came up for you when they said, no, I can't have coffee with you. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, what, what internal voice or behavior was put into that subconscious of yours? Um, I call them underlying automatic commitments. What commitment is there that says you're not good enough or, you know, why did you get hurt? Think about it. And, you know, you have to regroup because people are unstoppable who want to be influential. You know, you can't just give up. You have a big mm -hmm. dream. And it takes as much energy to have a big dream as it does a small dream. So why not dream big? Yeah. I always say that anyway. Beautiful we, way to say it. <laughs> Thank you. We we're gonna go to commercial break in about a minute. Um, why don't you know what? Why don't you give us your your um, web address? Um, you know, I'd love to give people um, the thirty day influence challenge that'll help them practice this skill. Perfect. And if you go to massinfluencethebook.com, you can sign up for my thirty day influence challenge, and we'll send you the links to where you can get the the uh, complimentary digital version of my book for free. We give it away on Amazon and Barnes and it's Smashwords. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, and I love it. I, I started to do it. I started to do the thirty day because uh, it, and it's because it's fun. <laughs> I like to do <laughs> things. We're gonna go to commercial break. While we're at our break, go to the address, the URL that that Teresa just gave you, and when we come back, let us know what you think. With Coach Frankie Picasso, we'll continue right after these messages. Stop. Welcome to Geraldine Tegelove Live, the show that shares with you the secrets of redefining, reinventing, and rebuilding your life. Having pulled herself from the rubble of financial ruin and having gone on to create a highly successful career, Geraldine has become an expert in the art of transformation. She believes that it doesn't matter where you are right now, how overwhelmed you feel, or how impossible the task of turning your life around may seem. You can do it. Stay tuned as metaphysician, international best-selling author and intuitive, Geraldine Tegelov gives you the inner understanding and the outer practical how-to to create your amazing life. Gain a fresh perspective on how to redefine, reinvent, and rebuild your life. Join Geraldine Tegelov live every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on the Toginet Radio Network. This is the Toginet Radio Network, radio with a cutting edge. It's words you never heard. Have you ever walked into a room on a mission to get something and totally forgot what you went in there for? I do it all the time, which makes me feel like a total sieve head, as the Brits would say. Some might blame it on old age, but a recent study reported in the Quarterly Journal of Experimental Psychology suggests the simple act of passing through a doorway causes memory lapses. It appears the brain regards a doorway as an event boundary and effectively files away whatever you were thinking about as soon as you step through. What's a word for the feeling your thoughts are being stolen? New kleptia. So, what's the solution? Try carrying an object that reminds you of the task. For example, if you go into another room to get a pair of scissors, carry the object you want to cut. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words.
And we're back. <laughs> we're talking about influencing, being a leader, because only leaders can be influencers. Isn't that correct, Teresa? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's something that, that you just have to be. Like you can't, you can't be a follower and be an influencer because nobody's going to follow you. So well, you really, to... influence is the core skill of leadership, right? Yeah. If, if you can't influence others to take action, you're not leading. So, you know, you've been very generous to me. And so I want to talk about gifting influence because I think it's one of the most important, obviously it is one of the actions of an influencer, but, you know, it's certainly most important in my life. (laughs) We all like gifts. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, it's so true because the more influence you give, and here's the thing, you have an unlimited supply of influence to give out. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize this. They think they have to be judicious or... Um, really think about it. The one thing you have to think about is to be authentic. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you don't really mean it, don't say it, you know, but you don't have to limit the amount of influence. There's no competition here. Like if you big up one restaurant in the area, it doesn't mean you're saying all the other restaurants aren't good. You get, you get what I'm saying? So yeah, there's no there's no limiters on how much influence you get out you can give out the only limiter is do you really deeply admire whoever it is that you're endorsing right now but the more you endorse the more influence you give out the more influence that will come back to you cuz any time that you hold someone up as being worth listening to hold someone up as a leader the first thing they're going to do is praise and validate you. It's natural human reaction, right? Like if, if two people connect uh, or if somebody connects two people together, the first thing they'll always do is talk about how much they love the person who made the connection. Mm-hmm. I still remember that it was Maura Sweeney who connected you yes. and I. I love yes. Maura's work, I right? Know. We're going to give Maura a shout out now. The happiness like, ambassador. <laughs> no kidding, right? And, um, you know, so we'll always both remember her fondly because we both love working together and are helping each other now in business. But here's the thing. You know, I trust Maura. You trusted Mm -hmm. Maura. And Mm -hmm. I trust that you're going to bring me people that I'm going to trust because you are who you are. And you had a little bit of a controversy with uh, on the council. And because I do want to talk about this because, you know, the idea of of giving currency to somebody, of giving influence to somebody, even though, you know, I might not have met them. And you say, you know what, tick tick the box, follow them anyway, don't worry about it. They're good people. And some people would have a problem with that. And other people would not. Yeah. And again, this comes down to unspoken norms and rule books, right? Mm -hmm. Or or like, what is the the speech code tend to be of your industry? And you know, I talk about this in Mass Influence a bit. In, in the early days of setting up the Evolutionary Business Council, which is the community I run of people who really want to create change in the world and, and do it in a mass influence way, um, in the EBC, you know, there is a norm, as is common in the industry amongst people who, you know, are infopreneurs, I might say, <clears throat> you know, people who push out new ways of thinking and new information, that people, for example, would offer to give an endorsement for a book and there's an unspoken understanding that if I say I'm happy to endorse your book, it means you're going to send me the book, I get to look at it, right. and then I'll validate, yes, I'll endorse it, right? Mm-hmm. But we actually had a gentleman come on our call, and he wasn't used to the industry, and it was a new call, and I failed to mention to him that that is the norm. And uh, the person on the call that was asking, you know, I'm looking for endorsements for my book, is anyone willing Um, happened to be Dr. Steve Hobbs, who's beloved, especially in Canada. He's like one of the more senior speakers in Canada. Steve Hobbs has helped so many people in this industry get their start. I'm I'm one of them, right? So, of course, the minute Steve, and many of us have read all of Steve's other books as well, because Steve has quite a few best-selling books. So immediately everyone on the call went, hell yes, of course, Steve. And this other individual who wasn't related to Steve or his work, all he heard was, wow, these people endorse stuff and they haven't even looked at it. Right. So they can't be authentic. So there's got to be an authenticity here. Mm -hmm. So there's always a level of, okay, you got to get used to the norms in your industry, whatever it is, because mass influence does work a little differently depending on what industry you're in. Like in in the television show business industry, there's one set of norms. In the online digital world, there's another, right? And um, 
but it does become important to realize that there can be a little bit of trust that starts at the beginning if you've been connected by someone who has endorsed mm -hmm. someone. In mm -hmm. other words, I trust you, Frankie. If you said you really need to go meet this person, they're awesome. My boundaries would not be completely rigid around that person because I trust you. Let me ask you something because this is something that happens to me on LinkedIn quite a bit, and it re and it it annoys me. And maybe I'm wrong, but people people you know um, they want well. First of all, they'll say, "Hey, would you in would you endorse me?" And I don't even know them. Like I've never met them. I don't know their name. Yeah. I don't know anything about them. And and I'm like, no, because that, I don't even know you. That's a premature ask. Yeah, that's, that's a premature that's, ask. Yeah, because they they have, they, they, they want to write yeah. something about me and they don't know me. And I, yeah. you know, I said, please don't do that. Don't do that about me. Yeah. A because how do you, you don't even know me. You haven't had a conversation with me. How do you know what I think and feel and, or anything? Yeah. Um, and then there's information going out about you that you haven't vetted or yeah. know about. And that, you know, can be dangerous in some ways. Well, and the neat thing about that is LinkedIn allows you to not allow recommendations to be posted to your, um, to your profile. So you can just ignore the ones that people write that you've never <laughs> met, you know? <laughs> But, but, you know, that's just people being messy, trying to learn the new sport. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they are appropriately seeing that you've got to give energy to get energy. Like, here's the thing, you know, until I wrote Mass Influence, I, I don't think there was a single book in the industry that really talked about the etiquette and the habits of dealing with influential people, at least not at this level. Right. Right. Um, there's certainly Caldini's book on influence, but he deals mostly with the topic of one-on-one -on -one conversations, not one too many conversations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, the way they've been learning this sport is trial and error, and it's messy, just like life is messy, right? So the one thing I usually request to people is, you know, be forgiving of the people who are trying this on and it's sloppy. And if you want, send them a copy of my book. It's free. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot of good people out there and they're trying to do good things. And it's like they know they need to learn to play hockey, but no one has ever taught them how to skate. And right. I like to have a warm place in my heart for those people because they're doing the best they can in that moment. And this is one of those things, like, once somebody points it out to you, you will never make that mistake again. It's so obvious to you. But until someone points it out to you, it feels like it might be the right thing to do, and you just don't know, right? Well, here's the other thing that you did right, is that you you found a solution to a problem, mm -hmm. and you and you ran with it, and that made you influential. Mm -hmm. And and so that's a key to other people who are looking to be an expert in their field. You have to find, you know, that 1%. What is going to make you different? What's going to set you apart from other people? What do you have to give that, mm -hmm. that isn't being given right now? Because mm -hmm. we don't need the same old, same old. Yeah. Right? We need something different. And and so I think that's that's an important message to them that you give is for to help them, you know, f find out what you're passionate about give it some air, you know, let it breathe and, yeah. and, and, and then shoot it out there. Let there be, yeah. you know, th this mass epidemic. Now epidemic is, is an interesting word because generally it's a negative, you know, there's an epidemic and people go, Oh, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. I love recreating words. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a passion of mine. Like, let's see if we can take a really dark word and turn it light. I like it. Because <laughs> it. it's now you have an epidemic of positivity out in the world. How, exciting is that we need an epidemic of positivity oh my yeah, gosh yeah desperately the, the world is in pain in a lot of places right now it's it's challenging to watch so you know what's really fun um when i was when Maura introduced me to <laughs> to teresa uh, she goes oh by the way you're talking to me in costa rica you're not talking to me in calgary and she goes let me show you where i live and she turns you know takes her her ipad and she turns it around <laughs> You know, she's showing me the ocean and the cliffs and the beautiful Costa Rica that she's living in. And now she tells us that she's back in Calgary where it's cold. But, you know, that, how amazing was that? And I'm like, well, that was a dream of mine. I <laughs> <laughs> how do I yeah. get that? Yeah. You know, when you get really intentional about creating the life you want to live and the impact you want to have on the planet, you start to realize that you can actually create it any way you want. That's and not that that happens overnight, you know, I mean, I, I've been on this journey of running my own business as a training company for 10 years now, but 
but you can get to the point where it's like, you know, what I'd really love to do is actually create a physical location where our community meets. Mm -hmm. And that's now manifesting. You know, we're creating a community called Vista Mundo down in the Central Valley of Costa Rica, where it's like one of the most perfect climates on the planet. I'm just noticing how cool the Canadian summer is now. <laughs> and, she lived uh, in the coldest province in the world. Yeah, I know. I'm in Alberta. So it's, you know, I'm at the base of the Rockies. So we're having kind of a blustery day today. But, um, you know, it really is special and miraculous what you can start to create when you just stand in. I really do want to create shift and change in the world. And I love that. You know, we've got, I can't believe the show's almost over. We've got like three minutes left, I think. So if we haven't caught something that you wanted to talk about, let's do that now. Is there something that, that, we've, that we've missed? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Two minutes now. Put the pressure Lots that we missed, but what would be the important thing to say right now? Um, you know, it, do yourself a favor and, and, uh, and do get the 30 Day Influence mm -hmm. Challenge is what I'd say and get the book. Yeah. Um, because life is short and life is way too short to think that your dreams are something that happens someday way out there. Maybe someday is now and maybe living the life of your dreams takes action. Even if it's just 10 minutes a day where you lean closer to what is that world you want to create? And I don't just mean the dreams of, do I want a bigger house or a nicer mm -hmm. car? Most of you out there have something burning in your soul that you would like to leave as a legacy here in the world to change something about your neighborhood or your community or the way the world thinks or um, to build a better contraption or to have um, a better, better way that we approach a certain illness. There's something, something in each of your hearts that is actually the nibbling of the bigger dream that you have in your life. And it has nothing to do with how much abundance you have and everything to do with how much abundance you have. In fact, when you start to see it, you start to realize it is actually the quickest route to a really abundant life. Because when you find that thing that lights you up that you could give to humanity, when you find that, everything in your life starts to fall in place. You know, a lot of, a lot of us. I'm going to stop you there. I got to stop you there because we're really right. out of time, but I want people oh, to go so to www.wildfireacademy.com. <laughs> get Teresa's monthly newsletter and unspoken rule number 15. I like it. Uh, if you don't take a risk and put yourself out there, you'll not be taken seriously by influential people. Thank you so much, Teresa, for coming on the show today. Absolutely love it. Massinfluencethebook.com. Get it. Don't Thank forget. Thank you so much, Frankie. It was a <laughs> Stop. When the chips were down, they didn't stop. Stories of people who, when the odds were against them, turned defeat into victory. You've been listening to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. See you next time, and always remember... Don't, 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 don't stop.